the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Welcome to our new series based off the memoirs of the court of Queen Elizabeth. On the 7th of September, 1533, at the Royal Palace of Greenwich in Kent, was born under circumstances as peculiar as her afterlife proved eventful and illustrious, Elizabeth, daughter of King Henry VIII and his queen, Anne Boleyn. Delays and difficulties equally grievous to the impetuous temper of the man and the despotic habits of the prince had for years obstructed Henry in the execution of his favorite project of repudiating, on the plea of their too near alliance, a wife who had ceased to find favor in his sight, and substituting on her throne the useful beauty who had captivated his imagination. At length his passion and his impatience had arrived at a pitch capable of bearing down every obstacle. With that contempt of decorum which he displayed so remarkably in some former and many later transactions of his life, he caused his private marriage with Anne Boleyn to precede the sentence of divorce which he had resolved that his clergy should pronounce against Catherine of Aragon. And no sooner had this judicial ceremony taken place than the new queen was openly exhibited as such in the face of the court and the nation. An unusual ostentation of magnificence appears to have attended the celebration of these august nuptials. The fondness of the king for pomp and pageantry was at an all-time excessive, and on this occasion his love and his pride would equally conspire to prompt an extraordinary display. Anne, too, a vain, ambitious, and light-minded woman, was probably greedy of this kind of homage from her princely lover, and the very consciousness of the dubious, inauspicious, or disgraceful circumstances attending their union might secretly augment the anxiety of the royal pair to dazzle and impose by the magnificence of their public appearance. Only once before, since the Norman conquest, had a king of England stooped from his dignity to elevate a private gentlewoman and a subject to a partnership of his bed and throne. And the bitter animosities between the queen's relations on one side and the princes of the blood and great nobles on the other, which had agitated the reign of Edward IV, and contributed to bring destruction on the heads of his helpless orphans, stood as a strong warning against a repetition of the experiment. The unblemished reputation and amiable character of Henry's sometime wife had long procured for her the love and respect of the people. Her late misfortunes had engaged their sympathy, and it might be feared that several unfavorable points of comparison would suggest themselves between the high-born and high-minded Catherine and her present rival, once her humble attendant, whose long-known favor with the king, whose open association with him at Calais, whether she had attended him, whose private marriage of uncertain date and already advanced pregnancy afforded so much ground for whispered censures. On the other hand, the personal qualities of the king gave him great power over popular opinion. The manly beauty of his countenance, the strength and agility which in the chivalrous exercises of the time rendered him victorious over all competitors. The splendor with which he surrounded himself, his bounty, the popular frankness of his manners, all conspired to render him, at this period of his life, as an object of admiration rather than of dread to his subjects. While the respect entertained for his talents and learning and for the conscientious scruples respecting his first marriage, which he felt or feigned, mingled so much of defense in their feelings towards him as to check all hasty censures of his conduct. The Protestant party, now considerable by zeal and numbers, foresaw too many happy results of their cause from the circumstances of his present union 
to scrutinize with severity the motives which had produced it. The nation at large, justly dreading a disputed succession, with all its long exercised evils, in the event of Henry's leaving behind him no offspring but a daughter, whom he had lately set aside on the ground of illegitimacy, rejoiced in the prospect of a male heir to the crown. The populace of London, captivated as usual by the splendors of a coronation, were also delighted with the youth, beauty, and affability of the new queen. The solemn entry, therefore, of Anne into the city of London was greeted by the applause of the multitude, and it was probably the genuine voice of public feeling, which, in saluting her as Queen of England, wished her, how much in vain, a long and prosperous life. The pageants displayed in the streets of London on this joyous occasion are described with much minuteness by our chroniclers and afford ample indications that the barbarism of taste which permitted an incongruous mixture of classical mythology with scriptural allusions was at its height in the learned reign of our eighth Henry. Helicon and Mount Parnassus appeared on one side. St. Anne and Mary, the wife of Cleophas, with her children, were represented on the other. Here the three graces presented the queen with a golden apple by the hands of their orator, Mercury. There the four cardinal virtues promised in set speeches that they would always be aiding in comforting her. On the Sunday after her public entry, a day not as this period regarded as improper for the performance of such a ceremonial, Henry caused his queen to be crowned at Westminster with great solemnity, an honor which he never thought proper to confer on any of her successors. In the sex of the child born to them a few months afterwards, the hope of the royal pair must doubtless have sustained a severe disappointment. But of this sentiment, nothing was suffered to appear in the treatment of the infant, whom her father was anxious to mark out as his only legitimate offspring and undoubted heir to the crown. Thank you so much for joining me on this first installment of Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth by Lucy Aiken. If you enjoyed this episode, please check back for the next installment coming soon. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.